Fighters Only Television here in Nottingham, England, and it's Friday. It's the day before tomorrow's UFC on Fuel TV 5 event featuring Stefan Struve and Stipe Miocic in the main event. And also on the card is Mr. Tom Watson, who's making his middleweight debut for the organisation, and he will be coached and cornered by the man sitting next to me, Mr. Greg Jackson. Greg, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, let's start off with uh, Tom Watson. You've been training Tom for how long now? Oh, it's been a couple of years at least, maybe even five years. It's been a long time. Um, you know, I'm really privileged to work with him. He's a great guy, a uh, tremendous human being and a great fighter. And yeah, I'm, I'm lucky I get to be one of the coaches that helps him out. Was he the first English guy to join your camp? I believe he might have been. That's yeah, I think so. Um, I get hit in the head a lot, so it's hard to hard to remember. But I, that might be uh, that might be true. And um, when he first arrived, obviously we don't have this this high school and college wrestling thing over here. Like, do you notice uh, maybe not just Tom, but English guys in general when they come to your place, is wrestling a big deficiency compared to your American guys? And um, if it is, he qu they quickly catch up. Um, it's it's an environment at our school where. Uh, you, you kind of sink or swim, so uh, if you can't figure it out quickly, uh, it's probably not for you, and, and Tom was able to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, and he the things that he, if he can't figure out a way to get real high level real quick, he can figure out ways around it, like he'll punish you for taking him down kind of a thing. So uh, he, he's an extraordinary fighter, he really is. So Tom's obviously quite well known here in the UK on the MMA scene. Uh, he's making his UFC debut. You're probably the most experienced, uh, certainly the most well-travelled coach in the, the UFC scene at the moment, and um, you go to a lot of events, familiar with a lot of the fighters. How do you see Tom fitting in with that middleweight division, and what do you see his prospects being? I think his prospects are great. I think uh, he fits right in there with with uh, good guys, and uh, um, he, the sky's the limit for him. Really, you know, he's he's shown. He's versatile, he's tough, um, he's smart, and, and those are the qualities that you need to, to really go far. So he can go all the way. So, travel, you're here in England, you arrive today, your show's on Saturday, you'll be going home, I guess, as soon as you can on Sunday. And uh, what does it look like after that then? Uh, then Wednesday, I leave for uh, Minnesota. I've got four on that card, and then Brazil, and yeah, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, I swim, I look out, I say, oh, I'm in some water in a nice swimming pool, and then I just keep swimming. That's kind of my life. Right. So, run us through uh, like what an average day looks like, because you've got... I don't, how, many, how many fighters are you involved in coaching directly on a daily basis, first of all? We have about, uh, all told, amateurs and everything, we've got 60 fighters at, at the school, and about 25 of those are, 25 to 30 of those are in the UFC or uh, Strike Force. Um, so it's it's a long day. I get there pretty early, and uh, yeah, I kind of go all day and get usually about a 12-hour day. Right. Yeah. So, so this is like you've got like a direct coaching uh, or, or strategy involvement with all six of these guys, or is it a kind of division of labor? There's a lot of delegation because, uh, and we have great coaches better than I am working with me. Uh, Mike Winklejohn being one notable one who's my partner, and. Uh, um, so we have a lot of coaches helping out, um, and I, I am really focusing now on just helping out the guys kind of at the, at the upper level and kind of working your way up. But uh, I try to help everybody as much as I can, of course, but just time constraints alone. So we just put new protocols in, hopefully, that'll, that'll make sure that everybody gets taken care of equally and things should be good. What time does your day start? I usually get going around 6 a.m., 6, 6.30, and then I get home to my wife and kids around the same time, 6 p.m. So. Right. so long, so it's like seven days a week as well, I guess. You don't get much downtime. Uh... It, seven days usually because I'm traveling. So, yeah, on the weekends, I'm and you know, you fly in, fly out and stuff. So every once in a while, I get a Sunday off, which is nice. Right. So, so, so your camp for a long time has seemed to be like the go-to camp, especially for guys that have kind of just arrived in the UFC and they want to get like a few different looks and, and like... Um, higher level import they often head to Jackson's MMA but there's so many guys down there already how do you kind of work out sort of who can come and who can't uh, like are you still open books at the moment or yeah we still accept uh, new fighters and uh, it's a lot of a personality thing you know we're not the team for everybody there's some people that don't click with us and and uh, then that's fine um, but uh, you know as long as you come down and, and you're willing to you know share with your teammates time with your coaches so to speak and uh, you have a humble attitude and you you kind of have a one for all and all for one mentality you're always welcome this mentality you uh fond of, of saying like the sort of the family thing down at Greg Jackson's and stuff like that and um, you've recently been criticised by a very prominent figure by the name of Mr Dana White who uh, well, he basically came out and said that's a load of rubbish uh, in stronger words than that um, any weight in what he said? 
Uh, well, I mean, it's that's not true. We are pretty tight. Um, and you don't need to argue things that uh, are obviously not true. I mean, obviously, we are... Uh, I mean, we're going to have, we have a lot of people, we have a lot of fighters. Um, it, it's very good that we have as little drama as we do, considering the numbers that we deal with. And uh, we're a tight team, you know, and of course there's going to be drama. you got a bunch of alpha males in a, in a room, and um, there's always going to be some kind of drama. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually a pretty tight team, and um, I'm there day in and day out. So, yeah, that's not true. We're pretty tight. Does it make it difficult for you at all when you've got the president of the organization and the organization itself is basically... 90% of the MMA market these days like do you, do you find sometimes you have to tread carefully does it make you uh, kind of hesitant in any of your dealings or no you know I just I do what I do I'm a trainer you know I'm not like a power player in the, in the political game or anything like that I just train my guys to do the best I can and, uh, and the best they can and um, that's kind of where it ends I got like I say, always say I'll say nothing bad about Dana White he's kind of my hero you know what I mean I was I was around before he was uh, he took control of the UFC and I remember what the MMA was like before him and the Fertitas got involved and, and really solved a lot of uh, a lot of problems so uh, I won't I won't say a bad thing about him um, he gets he gets a little excited sometimes and and uh, and you know he's very passionate like I've said before but uh, that's just who he is and, and uh, you know but you kind of put up with it when it doesn't go your way and and which you're appreciative of because that that same kind of fire is the same stuff that knocked open the doors for us right so you take the rough with the smooth exactly so another bit of rough and i'm sorry to to harp onto these uh these subjects but um the whole 151 cancellation the uh the follow i personally and i said this we had like a, a some time with danny yesterday the son and you know, he, he's a big name, popular fighter, will sell a lot of pay-per-view, but had no business being anywhere near a, a light heavyweight title shot. Now, that was my objection to it. I understand that yours was, you said that he was um, a completely different style of opponent and it would be a mistake to take him so late. But did did the merits of Son and getting a title shot factor in at all? No, because I guess I don't control that, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm just a trainer. I'm not a manager. I'm not anything like that. So um, fighting anybody at that level on three days' notice just isn't isn't a smart move for me. Um, but, again, I'm the trainer, so I'm going to come at it from a training point of view. Um, John is a, a guy that likes to be prepared, you know, mentally and physically and uh, uh, for a style of fighter, and, and I have to address that. That's that type of athlete that he is. Um, he comes in very well prepared and, and uh that's part of his what makes him so good so uh, I needed to respect that and so I gave him my opinion so um, with Sonnen you've got a team quest fighter Dan Henderson also a team quest fighter it was he was injured three weeks before he told the UFC that he was injured uh, apparently Sonnen didn't know anything about that sound plausible or take that with a pinch of salt uh, everybody that I've talked to said he actually didn't know anything about it, and so uh, I've got no reason not to believe that. But uh, the more important thing is, is that it, it, was he ready or not ready? Isn't is, as it, we didn't know that at the time if he was ready or wasn't ready. Right. And and you know, three days is is uh, tough to fight anybody on, and uh, especially if you want to be prepared and, and taken serious as an athlete. Right. So if they turned around now and said. Um you know, look, Son is still coming off that loss, but we want to put him in anyway two months down the line or something. Fair enough? Yeah, no problem. I mean, we'll fight him no problem at all. You give us a good training camp and, and uh, you know, John will fight whoever. It seems like that collision course is probably set for some point in the nearest future. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. So, um, John's fight with uh, Vita Belfort got caught in that armbar early on, which would have been a, an amazing upset, but he uh, powered through it, got his elbow popped. Very impressive display of heart. His arm was damaged, he, he carried on fighting and uh, even hitting him with the, the damaged arm. Um, seems to me that he, he's won a few people around because John sometimes gets a negative press. I think sometimes people don't know how to take him. Um, he, I think he's probably one of the most misunderstood fighters out there right now. Um, but he seems to have come out of it quite positively, which was funny because a week before he was the big villain for the cancellation and then he, he kind of came out of it looking a, a little bit heroic. Um, what's your take on the whole situation? Well, I think you know that you're just getting to know him, you know what I mean? Like, uh, he's a great guy, um, he's young, um, he's very tough, and uh, and he, de he demonstrated that, that will to win and, and that toughness. I mean, being in a full-out armbar the way he was and fighting through it the way he did, uh, I think it was very inspiring. And, and you might forget sometimes that he didn't... It uh, takes a lot of hard work to be as good as he is. He just doesn't wake up like that. We were expecting more of a stand-up fight from Belfort. Like, as the coach, did you, uh, were you surprised by the armbar so early on? 
no, uh, his arm bar is amazing, uh, and that's just a testament to how good he is. We knew it was coming, and he still got it, which is very, very good. Uh, he, he does that armbar quite a bit in, in, in his earlier fights, so uh, it wasn't a mystery, but he was very good at it. So, uh, I guess armbar defense and uh, sort of sub bottom submission awareness might be on the uh, cards for the next few weeks. Absolutely. Well, and you know, you can always get better at your game, and, and you can always make a mistake. You know, Machida was able to hit John uh, pretty good, and, and so you have to work on that. And, and it's a growing and, and evolving process. And, and uh, the great thing about John is he rarely makes the same mistake twice. What was the biggest learning curve for you there, Belfort or Machida? Because I think Machida's the only guy who's given John like a really hard round and maybe shown a, a path to, to dealing with him. Uh, you know, it's all learning. Even the even the ones that, that he wins is learning for me. It's all just I'm just taking in information, taking in information, and uh, some of it's positive, some of it's negative, and just trying to uh, accentuate the positive and fix the negative. Cool. Have you got any update on uh, Jones's elbow? I uh, no. Um, he is on. He is on a little bit of a vacation, so I'm letting him be. And uh, if it was a problem, I'm sure I would have heard about it. Cool. Okay. So just to finish up, uh, we spoke to Dana yesterday, and he said. It's looking like uh, Dan Henderson and Machida are going to fight next. Kind of a playoff fight, so I guess you've probably got no word on what's next for John. We just do it, uh, you know, what, whatever they put in front of us, we're going to have to fight. As long as we got a good training camp, we're good to go. Cool. Okay, Greg Jackson, thanks very much for the time. Appreciate it.